Hi, hello again. Uh, this is Richard Solomon of my uh, YouTube channel, Chai and My Narratives, and uh, the strong, the stroke survivor. Um, a while ago, or, or uh, a vlog before this, uh, which is the part one of my reaction to Doctor uh, Pierre Cory uh, Cory's uh, presentation in the podcast, in the pandemic podcast. Uh, medyo hindi po maganda yung ah, hindi po nawalan po ako ng internet to be honest with you which is I am hindi <laughs> uh, ko maintindihan may taka nawalan ng internet kanina na dumating pa dito yung sky cable guy no? while I was uh, doing the vlog recording of the vlog a while ago okay so anyway this time, this is actually part two of my reactions to the to Pierre Cardin's Pierre Dr. Pierre Corey's podcast. No, ito yung uh, member, uh, one of the elite member of the FLCC, frontliner for COVID nineteen critical care. No, so in yung grupo nila. Uh, I would react to part by part in, on this blog. Puputulin ko lang may ikse. I would give my reaction to each part, no? So, ito muna uunahin ko. So, gusto ko mag-react dun sa mga sinasabi niya and uh, translate into, into layman's term para maintindihan niyo kung ano yung mga pinaglalaban ni ni Dr. Uh, Pierre Cory bukod sa ivermectin, yung ibang other yung tinatawag nilang uh, their own version of protocols na dapat as experts, as medical experts, as medical scientists na dapat ginaga, ginagamit sa mga COVID patients uh, not, not the usual protocols or concoctions that is given by the reg regulatory uh, commissions of the World Health Organization which they find in their terms as anemic no and you will see this on this uh papakita ko sa inyo yung sinabi niya ngayon dito okay so bit by uh, uh bit by bit papa eh, magkakatay ng mga video the data showing its efficacy really strong efficacy and i'll review that quickly and then i'm going to um I'm going to talk about what you just said, Dan, which is, you know, why are the regulatory agencies not adopting ivermectin? And it's it's actually quite a disturbing story, and it's one that I'm immersed in, and um, I'm, I'm really, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. I, I'm, I'm a physician and a scientist. I am not a student of the world and how, how the healthcare systems work, but what I'm learning about it in COVID is really disturbing. So uh, I'll talk about that at the end. So real briefly. Um, and this is maybe a little bit of a bragging thing, but, you know, our group were uh, advocating steroids very early on. Um, you know, a, a paper done by uh, Umberto Maduri, one of the world experts in corticosteroids, who's my partner. He's in our group. Um, you know, we're some of the most highly published doctors uh, in our specialty in the world. Paul, Paul Marek is the second highest published uh, intensivist in the world. I mean, he's a thought leader and has been for decades, and so is Umberto Maduri. And he put out a paper with other five very prominent intensivists or ICU specialists um, showing that there was a critical need for steroids. Um, we also knew from other things, talking to people in China and Italy and New York during that first wave where they got just crushed uh, with COVID. Um, and actually, I actually testified in the Senate for the first time in May. Everybody seems to remember my testimony about ivermectin in December, but that was not the first time I was in the Senate. And I actually advocated that it was critical that we use steroids in this disease. And I did that at a time where you could see every major national and international healthcare agency was saying, do not use, do not use. People were dying. It's a steroid responsive disease and everybody was dying. They were filling up ICUs, they were running out of ventilators because the regulatory agencies waiting for their little randomized controlled trial. And we, meanwhile, experts on the ground knew, you know, when they first tried to treat this disease without steroids, they, they couldn't get people off ventilators. They couldn't prevent people from going on. I gave testimony then and I got crushed for it. 
you know, everybody thought it was irresponsible. I don't know what that is. Um, everybody thought it was irresponsible and and that I had no evidence. You know, you don't have randomized control trial evidence. And, I, and we had plenty of knowledge. Um, and so we advocated for it. And after that criticism and attack, six weeks later, Oxford, right, uh, the University of Oxford, they came out with their nice little randomized controlled trial and they changed the standard of care, right? So now the whole world used steroids and you'd think that's an accomplishment by Oxford, but it's not. The dose that they use helps the few and fails the many. You have, you, no one has any idea how many people are dying all over the world and have died over the past year because of this anemic dose of steroids that, the, that Oxford used in this trial. The entire world uses six milligrams of dexamethasone. Anyone who's been doctoring, anyone who knows uh, steroid responsive diseases knows that six milligrams of dexamethasone is a joke. Um, and, and it can be seen in the trials that have come out since. There's a number of trials, some of them single center or smaller. But if you look at the randomized controlled trials that use methylprednisolone, which is the core of our protocol, and we use higher doses. You know, when you look at the efficacy or the, the impacts of a disease, it's that we use this metric called number needed to treat. And if you look at the number needed to treat to save a life, this is the highest dose protocol that's been published. It's 250 milligrams daily. And you see this dramatic reduction in mortality, way more than the recovery trial. Yet what does the world do? They use six milligrams of dexamethasone. It's like nobody's reading, nobody's understanding that this disease requires high doses. Um, one of the reasons... Okay, yung napanood nyo pong clip ngayon, just now, uh, sinasabi po doon ni Dr. Pierre Corey, no? One of the elite members or heads of the uh, FLCC no? uh, na sila independent group na gumawa na nag, uh, whose uh, main objective is to create, develop uh, an anti-COVID uh, protocols or mga concoctions na mga drugs or uh, repurposed drugs para to battle COVID no? and uh, hindi nila Kasi, you know, if you have heard uh, uh, him say, we are the experts on the ground. Ganon sila ka-confident sa abilities nila because they are medical scientists, no? And uh, nakita nila, yung ginamit pa nga ng Oxford na sinusunod yung sa, sinusunod yung sa protocols ng uh, World Health Organization ay gumamit na 6 mg only of dexamethasone. And they said, that's anemic. Hindi nila sinunod yun. Yung sa trials nila, gumamit sila. So this is, by the way, other than ivermectin. No? Ito yung mga protocols, mga concoctions na kasabay na ivermectin na ginagamit na. At sila rin gumagamit na ivermectin. So, ang sabi nila, the steroids should be used in a higher doses. So they made it from 6 milligrams. They made it with their trials alone. They made it 250 milligrams because they saw that the COVID is responsive to steroids use. Ito yung mga corticosteroids which is dex, dexamethasone, no? So, ano po ba yung gamit ng dexamethasone? Ang dexamethasone po is an anti-inflammatory drug. And also, uh, an, it's also an immunosuppressant, no? So, they said, well, noong una nga, from the get-go or from the start, Nobody, the, the regulatory agency are contradicting them though. Don't use steroids and, and they are just, the FLC, FLCCC, they are saying from the get-go, from the start, no, kailangan na steroids niyan. Walang naniwala sa kanya, hindi sila pinaywalaan. Hindi daw dapat gumagamit rin ng steroids. Parang sinabi rin ng katulad na, na hindi rin dapat ginagamit ang by Evermectin. Pero sila, alam nila, you know why they know? Because they are medical scientists. Uh, ganito po kasi yan eh. Uh, before they made their own uh, or decide on whatever drugs they would use, yung concoctions, yung combination of different drugs, before they make their recommendations, 
on what to use like ivermectin and dexamethasone in higher doses alam nyo ang, ang pag-aaral nyan ang unang tinitignan nyo pinag-aralan nila is yung uh, ano yung make up nung COVID-19 mismo ano yung ginagawa niya sa pag, pag pumasok ka tao ano yung ginagawa niya how they do their viral work yung uh, an, paano siya umaatake sa yung parang mekanismo niya no pa, anong ginagawa niya sa katawan ng tao pag siya ay nakapasok na bukod doon sila knowing ko ano naman mga drugs na pwedeng gamitin of course they made some testing sa in vitro mag apply sila ngayon pag-uusapan nila ngayon kung ano yung mga mga ano yung concoctions na pwede dito pwede ganon kagaling itong mga to hindi yung basta ito bigyan nyo lang ng ganyan bigyan. hindi ganon tinignan mo nila yung mekanismo mismo ng COVID paano natin titirahin to paano natin atakihin to ano bang kahinaan na ito mga ganon so they would pick up from the already available drugs kung ano yung pwedeng gamitin doon and one of these sabi nga nila uy responsive si itong COVID sa ano sa dexamethasone but in higher doses kaya ano nakita na yung Oxford ginagamit 6 mg as instructed by World Health Organization sabi nila this, these guys are a joke sabi nung itong FLCC grupo nila Dr. Corey no? you use 6 mg so ang ginawa nila tinaas nila yung 6 mg to 250 mg at mas marami na save doon ang pinag-uusapan pa lang natin dexamethasone no? so hindi pa yung ivermectin so I just want you hinihimay-himay ko lang sa inyo kung ano yung mga approach na ito nila so let's go to another I hope we, I could discuss another um, segment from this video no? so ito po yung susunod na video then I'll make uh, again my uh, interpretation of what Dr. Corey, Pierre Card Corey is uh, saying to every clip for that matter. Okay? Watch for this. One of the reasons why the high doses is because the early COVID-19 is actually a disease called organizing pneumonia. Everybody all over the world calls it a viral pneumonia. It's not necessarily a viral pneumonia. Very few autopsies show cytopathic damage from viruses. It's early on, it's an organizing pneumonia, which is not an infectious pneumonia. It's actually an odd disease that's not well understood by most doctors. But the one thing that we know about organizing pneumonia is the primary standard care is steroids and high dose steroids. And I started to write this paper uh, that I wrote with one of the top uh, chest radiologists in the world. I wrote this in April. It was rejected by six journals. It took me six months to publish publish it. Um, one of uh, the journals, Chess, a very prominent journal, they rejected it during their peer review because one of the peer reviewers said, yeah, nice hypothesis, but we can't publish this until you do a randomized controlled trial of steroids. And so I was able to publish this after the recovery trial came out, although I already knew that this was a steroid response disease. And so this is really kind of what I think is an important uh, paper. And I get a lot of my former trainees who are uh, pulmonologists or respirologists, as you guys say, um, who are battling uh, lots of organizing pneumonia. And as they do literature searches, they, they text me and they write me, they're like, Pierre, this is a great paper or whatever. And so uh, we described this early on. The other thing that I did is I wrote another paper right here with a group of colleagues very early on. We knew this was a hypercoagulable state. When you get into the hospital, everybody was clotting. The clotting, the, the frequencies, were off the charts. And when myself and a committee at the University of Wisconsin put together a, a, a treatment code protocol, <laughs> our chair of medicine overruled the entire committee and said, no, you're not allowed to do this until the large RCTs are done, the randomized controlled trials. And guess what happened, guys? The RCTs were done. Anticoagulation is now the standard of care, but yet we couldn't do that for much. You don't have any lives again ha have been lost because of ineffective treatment while the regulatory agencies wear for, wait for their proper randomized controlled trials. It, it's really uh, upsetting, as you can tell from my voice. It, it, it's just been a really rough ride this past year, watching just character and fears of doing something without a randomized control trial when we have decades of experience and lots of insight into this disease. This is another example, the lack of steroids earlier on, the lack of good anticoagulation 
Um, it's really been terrible. And, and these were battles that were fought. And so I was profiled as a, you know, among many doctors uh, in a New York Times Magazine article uh, back in August, you know, talking about these wars. And actually, a lot of the wars were around drugs that I never recommended, like tocilizumab and remdesivir and other things. But the ones that I that we advocated for, uh, the, you know, the editor of the journal, New England Journal, said, oh, they, they just got lucky. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's not luck when you keep getting things right. And so um, uh, the other thing that we got right that I identified in May with my, one of my mentors is that this disease is clearly, clearly airborne transmission. You know, when you have a virus that craters the entire economies of the world and shuts down society, uh, that's a little different than the other diseases that we battle. Yet nobody was calling this airborne transmission. Airborne transmission means that in tight enclosed areas where you have poor ventilation, you need an N95 to protect yourself, unless everybody's wearing standard masks. And I started to, I wrote uh, an editorial back in May, it was actually accepted by the New York Times, but then the op-ed board changed uh, and then they rejected it. And the reason why they changed is because they put out an inflammatory op-ed and, and the, uh, uh, the main editor got fired and other editors got fired. The, the guys who accepted my article uh, got fired. Uh, so it took me another couple of months where I published it in uh, a, a national newspaper called USA Today. And I made the argument in this, in this article that, you know, this is airborne transmission. you got to recognize it. I was not alone. Many scientists from around the world over the summer started writing to the WHO in public open letters saying, this is airborne transmission. Yet the committee at the WHO still said insufficient evidence, insufficient evidence. It, it's bizarre. And then look, this is March 31st, March 31st. You know, this is a couple of weeks ago. There are scientists still trying to prove to the WHO that it's airborne transmission. Okay. Uh, in the just concluded second clip, no? Uh, sinabi doon ni Dr. Pierre Corey, uh, na yung uh, the this regulatory regulatory agency are telling everyone the medical community that people are dying of viral pneumonia. Ano ba yung viral pneumonia? As you can see here, viral pneumonia is an infection of your lungs caused by a virus. And they said, being experts, medical scientists, no, they said it is not viral pneumonia which is the cause of this uh, of, of their death of the most death in this with this covid it is actually the organizing pneumonia is the cause of death and ano ba yung organizing pneumonia as you can see here uh, uh, it says it is it states here that the new organizing pneumonia formerly named bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia or BOOP is a clinical, radiological, and histological entity that is classified an interstitial lung disease. The understanding of this family of disease has been great progress over the 20 years. Uh, and in addition, ano po ba yung tinatawag na organizing pneumonia no ang organizing pneumonia is actually an infection instead of organizing pneumonia refers to organized swirls of inflammatory tissue filling the small bronchioles and alveoli yan po yung sinasabing main cause of the death it's not actually the virus itself or that is the viral pneumonia but it's the organizing pneumonia yung result nung ginagawa nung virus dun sa bronchial cubes hanggang dun sa alveoli nung mga tao do, yun ang ikinamamatay nila hindi yung viral pneumonia okay so teka ipapaliwanag ko again yung next na na uh, dun sa clip na sinabi ni uh, Dr. Pierre Corey no so para dandahanin natin Another thing, no, another thing. Earlier, sinabi nga nila from the get-go of this COVID na kailangan ng napakadaas na uh, steroids uh, na dose of steroids 
dito sa COVID disease, no? And also, one of the concoctions needed are anticoagulation. Ito yung yung uma, yung cost nung tinatawag na organizing pneumonia. Nagkakaroon ng inflammation and because of this inflammation sa bronchial tubes, no? Hangga sa alveoli, nagkakaroon ng blood clotting. Kaya ang kailangan rin nila, isang sinabi nila, they strict they uh, strongly recommend aside from the steroids another concoction uh, or mixture is an, an anticoagulant because this is the uh, there's a coagulation that's happening in the bronchial tubes and of the of the patients of covid no so yun ang isang pinaglalaban nila and last but not the least Isa sa sinasabi nila na pinag-iitan nila which hindi ko na ma-forward dito no is that nobody believes at first they in, but FLCCC which uh, Dr. Cory belongs is that COVID was is airborne and you know what kinontra yun kinontra yun from the get go kinontra yun lahat na sinabi nila kinontra and hanggang ngayon Actually, lahat na sinabi nila ay tama. At yung siya sinasabi pa rin nila ngayon sa Ivermectin, which is the last part of this video, actually, ay tama pa rin at meron silang mga clinical trials. Pero hanggang ngayon, hindi rin sinusunod ng World Health Organization. So, kaya nga title ng video ko, ng vlog ko is, So, ano yung, ano yung pumipigil? What's stopping us from using the drugs? Tinagalog ko lang, no? Ano yung ano yung dahilan talaga bakit ano yung dahilan nila bakit nila pinipigilan tong ivermectin among other concoction protocols or drugs that they were recommending from the get go So yan yung mystery no yung mystery Now I think uh, hanggang dito na lang po muna huli ako at uh, mabuta tayo ng 22 minutes pinuputol-putol ko kasi eh. Ang dami magandang issue dito sa sa video ni ano no ni sa podcast uh, pandemic podcast na interview with the uh, doctor um doctor uh Pierre Cory no uh you, you know um hindi po ako doctor as I've been saying in every disclaimer of almost all my blogs but uh, having that uh, uh uh, experience for 20 years in the pharmaceutical field and talking to doctors for the, those 20 plus years uh, all these things that I've been hearing from from him and watching him in my discussions and to, I do not get bored because I get excited because there's a lot of things that you can learn from this video alone from him alone eh paano pa kung marinig mo pa yung ano hindi pa nga ako doktor eh no siguro pa sa ano yung, Yung, lalo na siguro yung mga doktor na excited sa mga sinasaba he's a medical scientist by the way uh, ako hindi ako doktor pero na excited ako because I understand a lot of the things that he's saying even in a medical term but he's trying to explain it also in the in the, the simplest way that he can in a layman's term actually you no know? hindi pa lingguahing medical masyado yan yung sinasabi niya actually na parang kasi kausap niya hindi naman I don't know if he's a doctor, yung interviewer, no? But, uh, uh, he's actually interpreting it in the simplest way that he can. And, uh, but still, marami medical terms pa rin, no? And, uh, ako, I'm trying to dissect also uh, a lot of things. And, uh, kaya nga sabi ko, ha, bago, bago ako nagbablog, I write a lot of things, I do research uh, on one thing to another, uh, because I want to be factual with my interpretations at the same time too. No? The reason why I can also interpret things is because of my experience and because I know how to read abstracts and I know how to in interpret clinical abstracts too. And I hope I, could, I am delivering things to you in the simplest way that I can and I, ho I hope I am understood at least. No? Minsan tinatagalog ko pero ang hirap kasi tagalogin yung iba eh. Well, wala talaga Tagalog nung iba no? o, o, o kung meron man, hindi ko alam no? so, but at any rate, dito po muna ako 
I think there will be a part 3. I don't know if there will be part 4. Ang dami po na ito eh, no? So, pasensya na po kayo. Hanggang dito na lang ako. Sana, mo, sana nabubuo nyo itong video ko. But with this, uh, for now, this is part end of part 2. Uh, part 3 will be coming to, to part 3 will be coming tomorrow. So, uh, as I always say, again, this is Richard Solomon of my YouTube channel, channel and my narratives. Please subscribe para tulong nyo naman sa akin, para may inspire naman ako na sa mga support nyo also. Please subscribe. Uh, like, like, and uh, share it uh, if you may do sa mga kaibigan nyo. So, I hope may nabigyan na naman akong magandang uh, may ano kayo natutunan kahit paano. So, with that, as I always say, peace, God bless, and uh, love one another, more so your families. Goodbye, good night for now, good night. Bye-bye.